open your Bible, if you will. We're going to start in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Hopefully you kept your finger there earlier. So just before Christmas, God was looking down at the earth and saw all the evil that was going on. He decided to send an angel down to earth to check it out. So he called one of his best angels, sent the angel to earth. When he returned, he told God, yes, it's getting pretty bad down there. About 95% of the earth is bad and only about 5% listens and follows you. Well, he thought for a moment and said, maybe I better get a second opinion. Called upon a second angel, sent him to heaven. When that angel returned, he told God, yes, I come up with the same assessment. The earth is in decline. 90%, 95% evil and only about 5% good. God said that wasn't good. So he decided to email the 5% that were good. Wanted to encourage them, give them a little something to help keep them going. Brother Harley, you know what he said in the email? No? Ah, so you didn't get the email either, huh? Only 5% good got the email. Anybody else get it? Anybody else know what it says? We're all out of luck. Amen. Gospel of Luke chapter 2. We just read a good portion of this, but I just want to back up a little bit and continue in chapter 2. Let's start at verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And this morning I want to look at why Christmas. And I want us to really think about that. Why Christmas? We celebrate Christmas. We, we, we put up beautiful decorations. We, we have family together. But why Christmas? Why is Christmas so important? Verse 8, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is called Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste. And they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. A few years back, I read an article written by a man who was a skeptic of the Bible. He doubted Christianity. And this is what he wrote. He said, on Christmas Eve, at the end of the arduous march that Americans make each year to the happiest holiday, it sometimes seems that they are supposed to celebrate Christmas as though they have agreed to forget what it's supposed to mean. He said, first, some really have forgotten or never knew or just never cared about the true meaning of Christmas. But they can still enjoy and benefit from the seasonal upsurge of goodwill. Secondly, he wrote, many Americans are a face that, are, that differ from mainstream Christianity and the origins of Christmas and it's Christ. When I read that, I thought, boy, how scary when a non-believer gets closer to the truth than many preachers do today. Amen. And this article really came to mind. A couple weeks ago, I was, I was watching uh, some TV, and a, and a news headline came on, and it said, A Defense of Jesus Christ at Christmas. When I saw that headline, it brought back memories of that article, and I, I really thought, man, have we actually reached that point in our nation, in our society, where Jesus Christ, His name is in Christmas. The very one that Christmas is all about needs defending at Christmas. I went and researched some, some polls that were made. Now, this poll was actually made in 2000. Now, that's 15 years ago. Now, we've declined in these last 15 years. But listen to this poll 
This was given among proclaimed born-again Christians. 26% believe that all religions are basically the same. 50% believe that doing good things is what gets you into heaven. 35% do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. 45% do not believe that Satan exists. And 38% do not believe that premarital sex is a sin. Now what this poll, again, this was 15 years ago, so you can imagine those numbers are actually even worse than that. And what this shows is that Christians in our nation are clearly conforming to this world and accepting the world's views over God's Word. Amen. Now, for most, Christmas is a sentimental holiday. But I want to make it clear that for the true believer, the birth of Jesus Christ needs to be seen as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, event in human history. Amen. Christmas is more than that, that sentimental holiday. His coming to earth, we need to look at it in just truth. It literally changed from B.C. to A.D. Amen? It literally changed history from B.C. to A.D. And we can truly say that everything is different since Jesus Christ came into this world. Amen? Now, His coming, as I said, is not sentimental like you know, the, the beautiful words of the little drummer boy. But Jesus' is coming establishes the truth of all that we believe. That's how important Christmas is. It also gives relevance to all the, the doubters and all those who write Christmas off as nothing more than giving of presents and eggnog. Amen. Because Christmas is so much more. And it's my hope this morning that we all see Christmas as the basis of truth for all that we believe as Christians. Amen. So let's start by just kind of going through some of the miracles at Christmas that God records in His Word. First, we see that an angel visited a virgin who conceived the child by the Holy Spirit. The baby in her room was literally the Son of God from heaven. God caused an unbelieving emperor to call for a taxation that sent Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem at the very moment that Jesus was to be born. Prophets foretold of both the virgin birth and the birth in that little town of Bethlehem hundreds of years before it happened. A star led the wise men or the magi from the east directly to the house where the young baby Jesus was. Angels appeared and spoke to shepherds in their field. An angel spoke to Joseph on three separate occasions. An angel spoke to and warned the Magi not to return back to Herod. Even Herod's slaughter of innocent baby boys was prophesied hundreds of years before it happened. When Simeon held baby Jesus, he prophesied of his death that's easy to do, right? We all die. But he prophesied of his death on a cross. So those are some of the miracles that surround the Christmas account in God's Word. Now let's consider some of the names that Jesus has given. And this is just in the Christmas passages. He's called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They said his name shall be called Jesus, which literally means Savior. He is called Emmanuel, which means God with us, the Son of the Most High, and Christ the Lord. Then there's also what the Bible tells us, the things that he will accomplish. He will save his people from their sins. He will reign from David's throne in Jerusalem. And his kingdom will never, ever end. Amen. Now those are just some of the miracles that surround the Christmas account. And what I want us to think about this morning is some of the things that we just don't think about enough. These Christmas truths, these Christmas miracles are beyond measure, if we think about that. But the truth is, we rarely do, do we? How often do we think about all these miracles as they actually happen when we, when we think about Christmas? 
You know, we, we sing those beautiful Christmas carols like Hark the Herald Angels Sing. But how often do we, do we meditate and we think about the words of that wonderful hymn? Listen, listen to what it says. Veiled in flesh, manifest in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. That is just rich with Bible theology. And another favorite of mine is, oh come all you faithful. We sing one of the verses, it says, Son of the Father, begotten, not created. Think about that. We don't hear enough sermons on that phrase, do we? Begotten, not created. And yet it refers to one of the most important, critical truths of Christianity. Now turn your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm chapter 8. And this is going to be the heart of our message today. Psalm chapter 8. We're going to start at verse 4. It's also on the screen behind me. Psalm 8, starting at verse 4. God said, What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All the sheep, the oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Now in these passages, there's a double reference here. Part of it refers to Jesus Christ, and the other part refers to you and I. Now what we see here, we see both the glory and the tragedy of mankind. We were crowned with glory, the Bible tells us. We were crowned crowned with glory and honor at creation. We were created to rule over and have dominion over the earth. That's our glory. We were created in the image of our creator. We were created in in, in the image of God, and that is our glory. Now we think about it, every two years, it used to be every four years, now it's every two years because they flip-flop between the summer and the winter games. But every two years, the world's greatest athletes come together to compete at the Olympic Games. They run, they jump, they swim, they hurdle. And in the end, whoever does it the fastest, the furthest, the highest, or the longest, they win what? The gold medal, right? They win the gold medal. And for that day, they are the best in the world. But that's man's vision of glory and honor. Records are made to be broken, and over time, just about all of them are, aren't they? All of our earthly heroes end up with feet of clay. End up with feet of clay. Next, I want us to think about Eden sank to grief, and nothing gold can stay. Anyone ever hear of Robert Frost, poet? Robert Frost is a very, very famous poet. One of his most famous poems he wrote, he said, Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day, Nothing gold can stay. Catch that Bible reference? Eden sank to grief. In four words, he describes man's fall from glory. When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, sin entered into the human race, and then death became our destiny. Sadness, Suffering, pain, all that entered our world when it wasn't there before in the Garden of Eden. When we were created perfect in the image of God, without sin, without any heartache, hardship. 
But once we sinned, all those things entered into our world. But as we read here in the, in the eighth Psalm, God is telling us that we were made, we were created for greatness. He said we were made a little lower than the angels. That's you and me, almost angels. Amen. How true is that? Almost angels, that's us. Just as some of those angels fell in sin, we did also did. We did the same. And we just look all around us, we see the evidence, the violence, the suffering, the road rage, the innocence of life that's lost. We see it especially when we, when we hear about a young child beaten to death by its own parents. We see it on the news every couple weeks. Those things are heart-wrenching beyond words. I just don't know how people get through without knowing the Lord. Amen. I don't know how they do it. It's hard enough for Christians. And we believe in everlasting life. But how does the world get through without knowing Jesus Christ? And that's what is meant. And Robert Frost wrote, So Eden sank to grief. Nothing gold can stay. We were made for so much better than what we see in our world today. As sin, our sin, runs rampant. We have sank so low. The truth is, we're more closer to demons than we are angels. Amen. That's the result of our sin. Next thing I want us to think about is, as we read here, why would God visit us? And that's what that's the heart of Christmas, isn't it? But why would God visit us? Praise God, all this negativity that I just talked about, that's not the end of the story. God made us for greatness, but we messed it up, didn't we? We blew our shot for immortality in the Garden of Eden. And as a result, all the cemeteries, all the graveyards are just filling up. But God's not finished with us yet. Praise Him. Verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit? Why would God even bother with people like us? We ruined Eden, and yet God gave us another chance. Amen? What did we do with that chance? Well, we messed that chance up so bad that God had to send a worldwide flood to wipe out the human race except for one family. Noah and his family he saved in the ark. When we look at our history, we think to ourselves, why didn't God just hit that delete button? Amen. No one could blame him if he did. But in this a psalm, King David questioned, his, his question here in verse 4 strikes at the very heart of Christmas. What is mankind that he is mindful of? And the son of man that you visit him. What is mankind that you should even pay attention to us? That you should even care about us? Why? After how miserably we have failed God. Why would God care enough to visit with us? And it's in that very question. That we see the wonder. The glory. Of the Christmas message. All the mystery that surrounds all those wonderful miracles that we see in the Christmas account. We see all that mystery, all that glory, all that wonder unfold. And it puts Christmas on full display. Amen. Now remember what we just read in the 8th Psalm. I'm going to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said, but one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him as they should be. But we see Jesus, 
who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul was writing to the Hebrews, and he, he referenced that eighth psalm, that psalm chapter 8. And I want to focus on three truths here. The first thing we need to understand in, in, in Christmas, in why would God visit us, in order to redeem us, Jesus had to become like us. That's the incarnation. That's what Bethlehem, that's what Christmas is all about. In order to redeem us, in order to save us, Jesus had to become like us. Jesus came into this world as that tiny little babe. Born in a stable. Born into poverty. Born in an obscure village. Born into a world that didn't even want him. No one knew he was coming. No one even cared he arrived. The angels had to make the announcement. And the world didn't even care. In order to truly visit us, he had to become like us. Second truth I want us to see is that Jesus tasted death just as we are all appointed to taste death. Anyone ever seen the old western called Ombre starring a young Paul Newman? There was a western out, it was called Ombre. And at the end of the movie, the bad guy tells Newman, he says, how's it going to feel to go to hell? And Newman simply replies, he says, we're all going to die. It's just a question of when. And then they both sh shoot each other to death. Life is short. The Bible tells us, God declares unto us, he says, it's appointed unto man once to die. Amen. Jesus could not have truly visited us if he held himself back from our last enemy. What's our last enemy? Is death. Jesus could not have truly visited us if he held himself back from our last enemy. In order to be fully man, he had to do what? He had to die. He had to taste the same death that's appointed to all of us. Jesus suffered and he died because that was the only way to save us. That was the only way to redeem us from our sins. Only by dying could he give us life. Yeah. Third truth. Jesus came to restore all that we lost in the Garden of Eden. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are in Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he, put, uh, till he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The Bible calls Jesus the last Adam. And the last Adam came to reverse the curse of our sin. Amen? In heaven, right now, Jesus is crowned with honor and glory. Amen? He is crowned with honor and glory. And one day, the Bible tells us that all who believe in him will be like him. That means we will be crowned with that same glory and honor because of Jesus Christ. We are joint heirs with him. That means all that he inherits, guess who else inherits it? We do. We do. But as we saw in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 8, It says, for you have put all in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things 
put under him. You see, that day hasn't come yet, has it? Where Jesus Christ comes in all of his glory and we will be like him. That day has not come yet. Today, we still weep for children who die too soon. Our hearts still ache when we see violence and an innocent life taken. We see all the suffering, the sickness, and all the death. We see sin's effects are all around us. But for those who are in Christ Jesus, the Bible declares that better days are on the horizon. Amen. Next, I want us to consider that our glory has faded. This is why Christian or Christmas means so much to the Christian. We think about it. We were made for glory, but that glory faded a long time ago in the Garden of Eden. Amen. First, we disobeyed and we sinned against God. And that caused us to start to die on the inside. The Bible calls that spiritual death. Amen. And then the truth is we started to die where else? On the outside. Physical death came into the picture. The Bible outlines the fact that we turn to our own devices. And then we decided to tell God, well, we don't need you anymore. Leave us alone. Then we wonder why the world is the way it is. But God replied, no. I'm not going to leave you alone. He said, I love you too much to leave you like that. So he sent his prophets to us. What did we do to them? We killed them. He wrote letters to us. What do we do? Sit it on a shelf, let it collect dust, we just ignore it. He showed us the way to live and how to be happy and how to be filled with joy and contentment. And we just simply replied and said, who do you think you are to tell us what to do? We mocked the God who made us. We broke his every law and we told him we don't need him. And then we started to make our own gods. Up here. Not necessarily wooden figures or or figures made out of stone. But we decided to make our own gods that we like a lot better than the God of the Bible. Why? Because those gods look a lot more like us. Amen. And we've made an absolute mess of everything. And God could have and he should have hit that delete button of humanity. But he didn't. He said, I'm coming down to you. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to ignore you. I'm not going to hit the delete button. I'm coming down to you because I want you to know just how much I love you. But we didn't pay attention. It didn't make much sense to us. And so he did. In a very strange way. Through a virgin's womb. As the baby Jesus born in Bethlehem stable. And that little baby grew up. And what did we do to him? We murdered him on the cross. And we were wrong about everything. After we put him in a tomb. Praise God he arose from the dead. He showed us that he was right all along in everything he ever told us. All the letters that he wrote to us. All the prophets that he sent to us. He was right all along. And friends, when we read the Christmas account, no one but God could have done that. No. Great author C.S. Lewis He wrote, he said, the Son of God became a man to enable man to become the sons of God. God has done it all for us. He wrapped his precious son in swaddling clothes and he said, this is my gift 
to you. He said, Merry Christmas. And this is what Christmas is all about. Amen.